This is the second sermon in our new series on keeping in step with the gospel, or to use the image that Joe used last week to push the gospel into the very corners of our life, e even the places like behind the toilet that don't often get cleaned, and not just to wave the gospel at our sin, but to use it as a powerful disinfectant to actually cleanse us from our sin, to actually gain new heights of love and hope and joy. This week I want to take that image a step further as we think about the love of God and what should flow out of that love for one another. One of the things that struck me most in these last couple of weeks has been a vision that's just captured my heart that's produced these breathings and longings and groanings in me that I just have a hard time putting into words. And one vision that I got from D.L. Moody, from an experience in his life, has just been captivating, just been grabbing onto it. There's a man named John Morehouse, 27-year-old evangelist, who came and preached at a church that D.L. Moody was at, and he preached seven straight sermons on the love of God from John 3.16. The seventh sermon, he wanted to go to another text, but he just said, my heart's captive here, I can't move on. My poor stammering tongue just simply can't express the love of God. If we were to climb up Jacob's ladder and talk with the angels and said, give us a greater revelation of God's love, they would take us to this text again, God so loved the world he gave his only son. And Moody, hearing those sermons, were like waves upon his soul, and this was his experience. He said, I never knew up to that time that God loved us so much. This heart of mine began to thaw out. I could not keep back the tears. It was like news from a far country. I just drank it in. So did the crowded congregation. I tell you, there is one thing that draws above everything else in the world, and that is love. And as a result of those sermons, he began to study the love of God again and again and again, and it literally changed his life, changed his preaching, shaped him, and dominated him so much that it defined him. Here's what he said. I took up that word love, and I do not know how many weeks I spent in studying the passages in which it occurs, till at last I could not help but love people. I had been feeding on love so long that I was anxious to do everybody good I came in contact with. I got full of it. It ran out my fingers. You take up the subject of love in the Bible, you will get so full of it that all you have to do is open your lips and a flood of the love of God flows out upon that meeting. There is no use trying to do church work without love. God's work cannot be done without love. We've been interviewing prospective seminary students, and we've been asking them to give us a defining moment in their life. Maybe it's a grief, maybe it's a hurt, maybe it's something that shaped them more than anything else. And my plea this morning is that the love of God would be the thing that shapes you more than anything else that it would so dominate you as you think, if you hadn't loved me first, I would still refuse you. And have that as such a shaping, dominating impulse that you can say, as the song said, all I know now is grace. That's all I know. That's all that I am. Without that, I am nothing. And so my prayer these weeks has just been, oh God, would you pour out your love 
the only way that the gospel is going to go to the corners of our life is if the love of God floods our life and goes to every corner of our life. And my prayer is that we would tether our thoughts then to a great text that opens up for us the love of God and our love for one another. 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. Because this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother, Why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil, but his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death into life because we are loving the brothers. The one not loving is abiding in death. And everyone hating his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we have come to know love. That one laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. If someone has the world's goods and sees his brother having need and yet closes his heart against him, how is the love of God abiding in him? Little children, let us not love with word or tongue, but with action and truth. Let's pray. Father, better is one day in your courts, one day in your presence, than a thousand elsewhere. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace, to trust him more. That's our prayer, Lord. Use this text. Would you help us forget the little preacher and give us eyes to see your great love, our God of grace and glory, our Savior with matchless love that is our song, is our theme. May it dominate us and define us. In Jesus' name, amen. There's three points that I think we need to see in this text. And before we get to the three, I just want you to notice that verse 11 begins with it begins with because. This is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that you should love one another, and this is an argument or a support going back to his statement in verse 10. We are able to know, it is evident to us, who the children of God and the children of the devil are. And it's not merely a profession of faith. It is living like God in righteous behavior, and it is loving like God, loving one another. These two things, living out righteousness, loving one another, the two times in 1 John you get the message from the beginning, we get a picture of God himself. 
The message we heard in 1 John 1 is that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. And if there's no darkness in God, then children of God should walk in the light as he is in the light. And if God is love, then his children should walk in love. You cannot be a child of God who is light and who is love and not walk in light and walk in love. It is impossible. And so now, building on this statement, he talks about the command to love one another. And the first thing he says is, here's what it's not. It's not like Cain. Point number one, don't love like Cain. What was Cain's kind of love? Well, he is a, a child of the evil one, a seed of the serpent, going back to Genesis 3. He epitomizes what a child of God is not in this Satan, satanic line. His version of love is the taking of life murdering. There's no giving of love here. They're simply taking away. He murdered his brother. His deeds were evil. And notice, as we start to reflect upon this kind of false love, he says, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Don't be surprised that 1 John 5, 19 says the whole world lies in the grip of the evil one. Don't be surprised when you live out the Christian life and live out the calling of love that you're supposed to live and it doesn't go over well. Don't be surprised by that. One of the most neglected commands in the Bible. We tend to just be surprised when things don't go our way, when people don't find us to be winsome and charming. And he says, expect it. If there really is children of God, children of the devil, probably not going to get along well. Why should you expect that though you're living the right way, that everyone would see it and love it? Don't love like Cain, the taking of life. And he says some strong words with severe mercy here for us. Notice when he starts talking about this kind of false love, he not only says that Cain murdered, he says in verse 14 that the one not loving is abiding in death and everyone hating his brother is a murderer. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. When we think about a disagreement with a brother in Christ, sister in Christ, we tend to minimize it. We tend to call it a misunderstanding, a disagreement, things got out of hand, but we tend to not want to call it severe language, as if we're great sinners when we do it. What we call a misunderstanding, a disagreement, God calls murder. It's the same in James 4. What we look at as quarreling, God says, is murder and coveting. Of course, both of these come from the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. If you say to your brother, you fool, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Don't murder. It's been said, I say, don't even be angry. As you progress in the Christian life, you begin to realize more and more what you've been saved from when you move from more external sins to heart sins and realize, I am a murderer. When I said the angry word to my wife out of irritation and defensiveness, that was acting out in murder. Are you going to look at it from God's perspective or from our own futile attempts to defend ourselves and minimize our sin? You will not taste the beauty of grace until you've tasted the bitterness of sin. 
you will not experience the freedom of forgiveness from this kind of taking away relationship until you have experienced the positive definition of love here in verse 16. This is how we know what love is. That one, Jesus Christ, laid down his life for us. See the great contrast? Don't love like Cain, that's the taking of life. Love like Jesus, the giving of life, the laying down of his life for us. That's what love is. And if you're anything like me, this should land on you like a ton of bricks and expose our lack of love. I used to think that love meant internal, happy, warm feelings for other people. That was the way I viewed love. If somebody asked me, are you a loving person? I would have equated that with niceness and said, yes. I have good feelings for everyone. I can't think of anyone that I actively hate and wish they were dead. I'm a loving person. And if Jesus loved like that, there would be no cross. If he loved like that, came to earth, gave a message, I have good feelings for all of you, and then went back up to heaven, no redemption, no visible love that meets us where we need it. And here we are with a definition of love that says it's the laying down of your life. And he says if that's the definition of love that defines love, then we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. This is not a sappy message meant to be cross-stitched on a pillow. This is redemptive, difficult, laying down your life kinds of things for others. It does not come easy. It can only come as the love of God indeed fills you up and pushes itself into the corners of your life and then out. Whether it's a flood of love coming out your mouth, coming out your fingers, getting into your feet, causing you to go somewhere, as I was thinking about this understanding of love the first time I preached this text, I realized we're here on a continuum between convenient and costly. I had been in the convenient view of love that said, you know, I'm a pretty good-hearted person. If someone just came to me and asked me for something, I'd be willing to do it. I would probably jump at the chance to do something for someone. I'm the give the shirt off my back kind of person and had such elevated thoughts of my ability to love, which God did not share. And then I began to see, no, on a scale of convenient to costly, where does the cross rank? Is, is that my kind of love? Notice what he says when he says you lay down your life for the brothers, here's the illustration of it. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother having need, not wait until they ask, sees a need, and you have an ability to meet it, and you don't, you close your heart, no love of God abiding there. Even the idea that we should just sit back and wait for someone to ask us, and then we'll move, already eliminates the biblical idea of love. Did God in Christ wait for us to ask? We love because he first loved us. Do you have eyes to see the needs around you? Are you on the lookout to practice visible, redemptive, laying down your life, cross-centered acts of love? Or are you passive, waiting for others to ask? What makes you feel more honored when someone sees a need before you having to ask and does it? Or 
when you have to ask once, maybe twice, crying out for help, and eventually someone helps, what is more meaningful? As I was preaching this the first time, I just said, Lord, I want this. Show it to me more, please. And while I prayed that prayer, I was sitting on the couch of my home in Louisville, Kentucky, and my wife was having a phone conversation. And it went something like this. Talking to one of her friends about her friend's friend that just had come into town, just had had a baby, and the baby had some back problems and was too young for surgery. So my friend is just perplexed about how to help her friend, so she, she calls my wife. And they're on the phone talking, and I'm listening. I'm thinking about this text and listening to my wife on the phone, and she's empathizing with this need and says, you know, you should tell her about going to a chiropractor. I used to work at a chiropractor. We had cases like this come in, and I really saw that it helped. Now, on the scale of convenient versus costly, where does that rank? That's, that's fairly convenient love. I'll, I'll relay this message to you. You tell her about chiropractors. Maybe she should try it. But she stopped. She stopped and said, you know, being new in town, she, she probably isn't very familiar with it. And, and if, you're, if you don't have experience with a chiropractor, then, then I would be willing to call her. We are in the midst of moving to Louisiana. We have boxes all around us. I'm frantically trying to finish my dissertation. And she has two kids and packing and says, I'll call her. But she didn't stop there. She said, you know, being new in town probably doesn't know her way around very well. I'd be willing to pick her up and take her to my chiropractor. And I saw the love of God. Someone once asked me, give me a picture. Paint me a picture of what it looks like to love one another. I said, God's already done it. It's called the cross. There's no better picture than that. Look it up in the dictionary. You'll find a cross. And I saw my wife that day moving from convenient to further steps of laying down her life. And I said, oh God, let me be that man. We know we're on the right track in verse 18. But it says, little children, let's not love one another with word or tongue, I think he means only. If there are only words and there's nothing else behind it, it's not really love. But with action and truth. If there's no visible action to see, love does not get put on display. If it's only there in the heart, God sees it, but others don't. If it's only there coming through in words, you, you, you hear it a little more, but it's not put on display in that kind of way. In a pictorial, you lay down your life for me kind of way. So point one, don't love like Cain. That's the taking of life. Don't be somebody that's always in relationships taking, taking, taking. And fighting when your desires aren't met. Point two, love like Jesus, the laying down of life. Point three, why is this so important? Look again at verse 14. We know that we have passed from death into life, perfect tense. We have passed from death into life because, present tense, we are loving the brothers. This is an astonishing statement to me. There's one other place 
where the New Testament, out of the 12 times where this word metabino is used, where it's used in the perfect tense, all other times it simply means to depart from somewhere. It was departing from here, went to here. There's one other time where it's in the perfect tense, and the exact same phrase is used, John 5, 24. In John 5, 24, you have the same phrase, but a different reason for the passing from death. Amen, amen, I'm saying to you that the one who hears is hearing my word and believing in the one who sent me has eternal life and does not enter into judgment, but has passed from death into life. You pass from death into life, Jesus says, when you hear my words and believe me and believe the one who sent me, you have eternal life. That's the answer we expect. We have eternal life because of what Jesus has done and our faith in him. First John takes it a step further and says, we don't love in order to be saved, but if we're saved, we love. We know that we have passed. The moment has come in our conversion where we definitively pass from death to life, and we know that that's happened if there's love in the present, if we see it in an ongoing way. I'm afraid that there's a false theology on the loose in the church, hopefully probably not here, that says really, let's, let's empty the importance of these commands. It sounds like works righteousness if you're going to say something like that. that. That we know we're saved because we're loving. I realized this one day when I was watching one of those info commercials. Um, this might be before some of your time, maybe not. Um, the, the big infomercial during those days when I worked at UPS late into the morning was the Ronco Showtime Rotisserie Grill. And it was, seemed like a great invention to me. You could uh, rotate, rotisserie your meat and set it and forget it. Walk away from it. I can cook for my wife and read my books. This is the best thing ever made. And so we got one for Christmas. And as I started reading the instruction booklet, it literally said this, do not take set it and forget it literally. Is this a book of Revelation? Is it a metaphor? How else am I supposed to take it? Stay with your meat at all times while it's cooking. And, and I said, that, that is false advertising. And then... It hit me like a ton of bricks, but that's really what's going on in the church. We're promoting, in some circles, a set-it-and-forget-it Christianity. And it doesn't exist. This should matter to us. As much as it mattered to John, as much as it mattered to Jesus, as much as it matters to God. 1 Corinthians 13. Paul has a long list of things you could do, but if you lack love, you're a resounding gong, clanging cymbal. You are nothing. You gain nothing. And we don't tend to look at it that way. We tend to think, well, if, if I had these prophetic abilities and I could understand all mysteries, that would be something. If, if I was giving all that I had to the poor... They're surrendering my body in order that I might boast. That would be something. We don't think in terms of God's math, like D.A. Carson says, that 5 minus 1 actually equals 0. Doesn't equal 4. We've done some good things, and you just lack love, so you've got four things. You have nothing. You are nothing. Oh, the BCS would not produce a whole class of spiritual zeros that know how to study, know how to articulate the love of God, but have not visible, active 
laying down your life expressions of love. Let's pray. Oh, for grace, Father, that we could put you on display, put the cross on display in every aspect of our life, all of our relationships, because your love has pushed its way into every part and every fiber of our being. We thank you for the cross. We thank you that we love because you first loved us. And let us stand dominated by love so that all we know is grace. And your love would come flooding from our mouth and our fingers and our feet and every part of us. In Jesus' name.